round round. I'm very happy today. Today, our guest is Jan Anderson Eloy. Good morning, Anderson. Hey, good morning, uh, Pierre. Good. So I requested um, Professor Eloy to have a discussion of uh, a controversial topic regarding open approaches and closed approaches, uh, endoscopic approaches on refractory chronic rhinosinusitis. So today he's going through uh, 30, 40 minutes of, uh, of um, a trip with the videos and presentation, and he's also um, probably techniques for treating those those uh, patients. So, as usually, I would suggest to all the attendees to uh, request question that will be uh, replied at the end of his talk. So, please, if you have uh, the possibility, share your presentation. All right. All right. Okay. Well, thank you again, uh, Puya, for getting me involved. And uh, I uh, want to say uh, I'm really impressed with uh, what you've been doing with these uh, with these seminars. Um, I think you found uh, the way to really uh, promulgate information um, and teaching. Um, I think you are someone who was ahead of the curve. Uh, you started doing this way before the pandemic. Um, and I, I, I can say that uh, um, having been uh, one of the guys who was a little bit uh, afraid of uh, doing things online, um, you've taught us that uh, this, is the, this is the new way. Um, and uh, thanks for all you've done for our analogy. Um, and I also want to say thank you for sharing some of your experience with us early on with uh, what's been happening with COVID-19. I think uh, you've, uh, you've definitely made a huge impact and helped save uh, many, many patients um, by sharing your own stories with, with, with the international community. Um, I, never th I never thought New York or New Jersey would be really, um, really hate the way they did when we saw it in Italy. We of course believe that um, um, this was something that was somewhat far from the United States and that if we we're going to get them, it would never be that, that way. But uh, we ended up having uh, way, way more cases um, and without your guidance early on and many others, uh, it could have been a, a way worse. So again, thank you for that. Um, so uh, my talk today is on extended endoscopic and open sinus surgery for refractory rhinosinusitis. I, um, I have to uh, add a disclaimer that most of what I do is um, heavily endoscopic uh, more and more. The open techniques that I've learned, um, I use them, um, um, uh, probably I've done maybe one or two uh, open cases I'll say over the last 10 years because uh, of the advances that we've made in endoscopic sinus surgery. So this is gonna be again, a heavily uh, biased to our endoscopic techniques. So I apologize for that. Um, my uh, second disclaimer is that uh, this is not a complete review of the literature. This is mostly um, my experience on how I do things. Um, I understand there's multiple, multiple ways to do things that may be the same um, or even better than the way I do. I do surgeries for those patients. So understand that, uh, that even though your technique may be different than mine, it doesn't mean that this is the wrong thing to do. Um, I do surgeries based on what I see um, in my own vision and what the, the case gives me, and I, I keep changing that. Um, and I'll, I actually advise everyone, um, even if you're in lectures, to continue to do that in the same fashion. Just make sure you are, um, um, you use your, 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 your own techniques um, what works in your hand may not work in other people's hands. Um, my other disclosure is that um, I tend to always put a picture of my family in any of my lectures. So this is my other disclosures here. This is Savannah and uh, Sebastian and my wife, Jennifer. Um, so um, beside that, no other disclosures to, to report. So let's go ahead into the I really, I really, I'm sorry for interrupting you. I really appreciate this. I really appreciate this because our family should be supported because they are supporting us all the time. Yes. And um, um, those, those guys have been keeping me grounded over the last three months with all that's happening. So thank you, Bria, for saying this. So um, 
when in this talk, we're going to talk about expanded surgical techniques, mostly endoscopic, again, in my hand, for we constitute maxillary disease, ethmoid disease, a spinoid disease, and then for frontal sinus disease. Um, some of those uh, things that uh, I've actually want to disprove to you guys is um, a lot of things that I've learned um, in the past that I've had to change in my practice. Uh, you've heard that mucosa should be preserved, and I agree. Uh, but some people believe that the mucosa should be preserved in all cases in terms of sinus surgery. Um, you've also heard that smaller sinus openings can achieve the same result as larger openings. Um, and you've also heard that always perform the least invasive procedure first. Uh, this is some of the teaching that I've always gotten when I was uh, um, learning um, as a resident. Uh, and, um, but I can tell you that all of those are not true um, because um, um, you need to be pragmatic in your approach. Uh, when people tell you those things have to be done in a certain way, you should ask yourself questions when and why should I always do it this way? Uh, you again, be, be cautious of dogmatic recommendations. Anyone who's telling you there's one way to do a thing, uh, I would probably not follow those recommendations. There's multiple ways to do things. A lot of them works. It may not be your preferred technique or ways to do things, but it doesn't mean that it's, 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 it's inadequate. Um, also, I don't think you should be afraid to change your approach and techniques. I always uh, go to lectures, listen to other people's approach. Uh, one uh, example was uh, this Saturday, I was uh, listening to uh, uh, um, um, Bataglia in one of his techniques, the flip-flop techniques. And um, this is something that uh, I'll say that I haven't really used in my practice, but I think it makes sense. And I'm gonna use it and change that. So again, do not be afraid to change your approach when you find something or technique that works better. Um, it's not a crime to remove the mucosa. So in some cases, that may be best for your patients to remove the mucosa. Some areas are less forgiving than others uh, when you're doing surgery. And um, you need to customize your approach to your patients and uh, institution setting. Very important. Uh, different people have different kind of tools at their disposal. And if you don't have the proper tools, you don't wanna do the wrong surgery um, because you don't have the tools to do it properly. So the right surgery without the proper instrument can lead you to the wrong surgery. So keep that in mind um, as well. So let's start with the maxillary sinus. When, what kind of technique do I employ for reconstituent maxillary sinus disease? Well, I trained in Miami with Roy Cassiano, and this is one of his papers where um, in 2007, he talked about his technique for extended maxillary sinusotomy in an isolated refractory uh, maxillary sinus disease. And in this technique, you would do what you see here, which is an inferior uh, myodontrostomy for patients who've had previous surgery that actually um, have recurrent disease. Now, uh, if you're doing this surgery, um, this is an, a cadaveric dissection. Um, I would take this all the way down to the floor of the maxillary sinus and open it all the way to the floor to allow gravity to be able to help you out. This is um, something that I've seen work, not only in fellowship, but over the last, last 12 years in some of my patients. Um, so I do this surgery from time to time, but um, there's another uh, procedure that I do a little bit more. Um, this is, uh, and, and when Dr. Cassiano did this, he did find out that in those patients, um, in his experience, there was significant improvement after you did these procedures. Uh, but just make sure again, you have to make sure you use gravity and take that uh, inferior, uh, that, that medial wall of the maxillary sinus all the way to the level of the floor of the sinus. Another technique which I tend to use now more often is, uh, with all of, uh, is the endoscopic maxillary omega and trust to me, or um, EMMA, which was, um, um, introduced by Peter Wong. And um, initially, he presented 28 patients, uh, 142 EMA procedures. 
And what he found was that um, the maxillary um, sinuses uh, that appear to be terminally diseased, you could rehabilitate those patients surgically using this procedure. Um, and uh, for those of you who haven't seen this procedure, I'm gonna explain exactly um, or how he performed the procedure. But the concept is still, again, make, making sure you, you, you try to use gravity to help you with these surgeries by taking the medial wall of the maxillary sinus all the way down to the nasal floor. And, uh, and later on, um, Peter did a long-term study um, to look at those, those patients. And um, what he found out was um, um, the original 2008 patients that he had in a long-term 6.9 years um, follow-up period, they were still doing well with the MR, uh, uh, with the MR procedure. This is an example of the MR procedure and the way I do it. Uh, um, this is a video prepared by my, my two of my past fellows. So this is a patient who had previous surgery and had recalcitrant disease um, in both maxillary sinus. So we're gonna see what we did here in the um, patient's right side. So in this case, the patient had uh, turbinate surgery already, so because of resection, you could see here there was significant inflammation with purulence in the maxillary sinus. You want to start by removing some of that disease. And then now what you're doing is demarcate with the endoscope exactly where you're going to make this incision uh, to take the posterior portion of the turbinate out. You can decide to either do a, you could do a little flap posteriorly here, or you could take this all the way down to the floor without the flap. Now using a 30 deg um, a 60 degree micro debrider to help. And then again, you wanna make sure this here get all the way down to the floor. And to do that, we're gonna use a, a drill as you would see. To use a drill, this is a four millimeter 15 degree drill. You could use a, another drill if you prefer. Um, this is the one I like to, to use. This is a Midas drill. Um, and then when you're done, um, you wanna make sure you clean that nicely. Now, um, very often you could get some bleeding in the posterior aspect here because you could see it. So you could just take this um, um, bovi to really turn it around so that you could get that blind spot in the posterior aspect that you wouldn't usually see. And uh, these patients typically would do, would do very well. So another technique that people use for the maxillary sinus is the endoscopic modified medial maxillectomy. Uh, this is a systematic review on safety and efficacy that was performed by Dr. Loftus and uh, Soler from MUSC. Um, and in this study, what they looked at was all the um, applicable studies in the literature that looked at the uh, endoscopic, endoscopic medial maxillectomy um, for um, chronic rhinosinusitis. And what they found out that although there was no high quality level one studies um, to evaluate the efficacy and safety of these procedures, there was significant level two to level four studies that indicate that this procedure is relatively safe and has low complication rate and symptom resolution in up to 80% of patients with recalcitrant maxillary sinusitis. This is the uh, PRISMA diagram uh, that they use to select the patients, uh, the cases. So for those of you guys who are not uh, um, familiar with systematic reviews and how to do them, this is an important step in how you select those cases um, for the study. And they found out that in instances where the endoscopic modified uh, medial maxillectomy is needed, this is an adequate procedure that can be used to salvage patient with chronic uh, maxillary sinus refractory to previous treatment. Now, one thing um, that should uh, you should be careful um, is the anatomy. Um, when you're doing the endoscopic modified medial maxillectomy, uh, keep in mind that the main structures that you have to be concerned about are going to be the teeth root um, and then also the lacrimal system. If you come significantly anteriorly, you might be um, able, to, you, you might actually call Hasner's valve. So um, although in my experience, even if you have to transect Hasner's valve, um, those patients really do well and they don't need any significant um, uh, nasolacrimal procedures afterward. 
Um, so this is an example, another example of a, of a patient who had an endoscopic modified medial maxillectomy. Um, one other things that I've actually done in those procedures um, is uh, if really I feel as though this patient has had multiple, multiple surgeries and they keep failing, I would remove the mucosa. And uh, just like you do with an endoscopic um, uh, medial maxillectomy for inverting papilloma, you could go ahead and you could uh, cauterize the, the uh, wall of the uh, sinus. And when you do that, this causes auto-obliteration of the sinus. So that's something you could do. So this is a video of the endoscopic modified medial maxillectomy. Uh, patient with, uh, again, recurrent disease, a lot of polypoid changes. So you wanna make sure you do the injection in here. And then take a true cut, we set the, um, inferior turbinate, and then use your suction bovi to really demarcate where you're gonna do it. Um, this is an area we see as nurse valve more anteriorly here. So we're gonna go ahead here, uh, use a frontosinus curette to remove this posterior portion, okay? And then uh, following this, we're gonna use a micro debuter and a drill to open everything. So we're gonna go a little bit forward, and then you use the drill. Um, just like I mentioned before, you wanna take this all the way down to the floor. You could decide to leave a little flap um, or you don't, you, or not. Um, it's a matter of preference. And then demucosalize it. This is what those patients who've had so many different surgeries and do not do better, um, I would make sure um, that I take the mucosa out um, because I believe this mucosa is condemned before you actually get to that level where you're gonna really remove the mucosa and cauterize it, you always have to make sure these patients don't have any kind of dental disease um, that's causing that maxillary sinus uh, problem. And then here we go after we, just like we would do for a, medial, for a, uh, a papilloma, you go ahead and you systematically remove the mucosa and cauterize it. And what you would see again in those patients is that when they heal, the increased irritation from the bovi causes this um, um, cavity to auto-obliterate. Again, you preserve that for patients that you really wanna, uh, you believe have had multiple, multiple surgeries in which you do not believe that the mucosa is, is going to be able to, um, to get any better. Um, and then this is, um, uh, yeah. Show this, okay, I don't think I have that here. Okay, so surgery for reconstitution eight more sinus disease. For this is um, examples of um, what you would do for ethmoid. Um, again, in some cases, it's not really bad to remove the the um, um, the mucosa in the ethmoid. Okay, so this was the maxillary sinus um, during the contraction. So um, in terms of the ethmoid, I'm sure now you guys have heard about what's called um, nasalization, okay? Um, this is a concept that is not new. Um, I think Barker is the one who's actually been we, um, talking about that, but this is a, a procedure that uh, I was doing in my fellowship with Dr. Cassiano. Again, the term condemned mucosa was used for, for the reason why you would do this. And you see this in here. And uh, this reboot approach was reintroduced by Klaus Backer from the University Hospital of Ghent, who believes that uh, in patients with chronic rhinosinusitis with mesopolyposis with uh, type two inflammation, um, because they keep having recurrent polyps, you can in those cases remove the mucosa. He called it what's called a partial reboot when you remove the um, ethmoid maxillary and spinoid mucosa or a complete reboot when you include a drive through and you remove the mucosa in the, in the drive three. I am not a complete believer yet with the drive three. Um, I still try to preserve the mucosa in most of those cases, but the partial reboot where you do it in all of these other sinuses, um, I believe that in cases of what you would call condemned mucosa, it, it's, it gives you significant help. Mm -hmm. With those, with those patients. Now, as I mentioned before, this is not something new. 
Um, uh, if you look at this paper, this is in 1997, Jankowski and uh, the Cook and Pigret already mentioned this, and they showed that in those patients who have, uh, if you compare a group who had nasalization um, and patients who didn't have na uh, nasalization, the overall nasal improvement was 8.8 .8 after um, nasalization versus 5.6 for total hemorrhoidectomy. The olfaction improve, improvement was similar in both groups, okay? But it decreased um, the longer you went in the cases that didn't have nasalization. And asthma improvement remained significantly better after nasalization, um, and they had decreased um, need for, st for steroid. So we've known for the longest that in some cases you can remove the mucosa. Uh, I don't think the um, group of patients that we should do that in is really a, a large amount, but I still believe there's a significant amount of patients who've had so many surgeries who have this condemned mucosa uh, that you may consider that. Now, because of the introduction of biologics, I would try the biologics um, in those patients first before going to do a um, initialization procedure. But I think there's actually a, a significant, there's a position for that in our, in, in our field to have some of our patients. And this is the paper from, uh, the, the, from Klaus Backer's group that clearly show that complete removal of disease mucosa from the paranasal sinuses, the root of push, um, showed significant improvement um, after 30 months um, in those patients. Now, this is a diagram from uh, um, this paper that shows what they mean by a full um, reboot procedure. Um, as I said, I stopped short of doing this in the frontal sinus, um, but they have gotten good results doing it in the frontal sinus. What about for the sphenoid? Well, in terms of recurrent sphenoid disease, so I think the same concept is actually true. For cases where you've had multiple, multiple surgeries for sphenoid sinus disease, um, you can potentially um, go ahead and do extended sphenoid. Uh, it's not really that different. You you just like you would do for a pituitary tumor, you do bilateral spinal sinusotomy, you do a small posterior septectomy, do the, uh, remove the enter sinus uh, septum, and then uh, following this, you go ahead and you scrape the mucosa and the sphenoid. Um, word of caution, make sure that there isn't any significant dehiscence posteriorly near the, the um, um, carotid artery or optic before you go and uh, peel the mucosa because you don't want to injure the carotid artery in those. And you, again, you can drill this um, all the way down. That would allow a much larger cavity that you could use to, to put uh, topical medication in. Um, and frontal sinus is gonna be what I've actually had uh, the most experience with in terms of expanded procedures. Um, Again, remember the anatomy of the frontal sinus is really challenging. Um, this is one of the best depiction um, that I know of the outflow of the frontal sinus, showing you what the anterior hemorrhoid artery is, um, and also showing you this landmark, which is the lacrimal convexity. In revision and extended cases where a lot of the structures may be missing in here, doing a, um, using the lacrimal convexity is a great way to do frontal sinus surgery. What you should know is this lacrimal convexity is gonna be the first bump that you see in the lateral nasal wall. It's typically about one to one and a half centimeter anterior to the outflow pathway of the frontal sinus, but most importantly, it's parallel to it and it goes in the same direction. The other things that I want people to realize is that the anterior or artery, the location of it, a lot of people think is really right posterior to the uh, frontal sinus recess. It's usually a little bit more posterior where there's a little bit of a distance before you get to it. So in terms of the residents that are actually watching this talk, this is one important point that I would want you to, to pay attention to. So in terms of looking at um, frontal sinus um, classifications, there's multiple classification out there um, this is the latest uh, from the, the uh, our European uh, from the European group. Um, 
where they have this new description of the type of frontal cells, calling them agonistic cells, superagro cells, superagro frontal cell, superbullar cells, superbullar frontal cell, superorbital ethmoid cells, and photoceptor cell. From an academic standpoint, this is a great description. Um, I think it's a good way to learn this uh, like this. But in terms of surgeries, um, my belief is this, this kind of um, um, classifications is not as useful. Um, I think in my experience, yes, it's good to know. Um, but what's important is to know the borders, okay? Because when you're doing surgeries, you're not going to look at the name of the cells and see whatever cells is in between the lateral nasal wall and the, and the middle turbinate. What you're going to do is you're going to look for the middle turbinate and the lateral nasal wall, and everything is between has to go. Um, no matter, again, if you have a type 1, type 2, type 3 frontal cells, uh, as people used to call it, or use these new classifications, that's not as important as knowing where the borders are and then do your surgery from one border to the other border. What I do think is important is knowing what kind of surgery you're gonna do and the extent of the opening that you're trying to do. Um, when you're looking at my philosophy in frontal sinus disease, I believe you should have a graduated approach, which is individualized to your patient to the extent of the disease. Patient with eosinophilia uh, and bad endoscopic finding, I tend to do a little bit more. It's just like treating somebody who is diabetic you go one step further based on some of those findings. Um, it used to be that you do as little as possible, but, but as much as necessary. I don't believe this is adequate anymore. I think now, because we understand more that you need to put topical medication in there, I think you have to do as much as possible. You need to open the, the recess so that medication can get into it. So you do as much as necessary and you do as little as possible. And I think this is true for surgeries when you're managing endoscopic scope surgeries as well. So um, you guys have heard about the draft one to A to B. And then draft three, I believe now is one of the procedures that I do a lot in my, in my, in my uh, practice because a lot of the patients, I'll say the majority of those patients are doing frontal sinus with, they have chronic inflammations and you need to get topical medications in there um, to prevent them from getting recurrence. And then those four are things that I've actually uh, added to the literature in specific cases, and I'll go over them. And then for the external approach, the tree find the uh, pontoid moidectomy and the osteopathic flap, um, but I do less and less of this in my practice now. Um, so when I talked about border, you've heard about the draft one. This is what the draft one means. You go from here to here. A draft 2A is you go from the lamina propitia here uh, to the middle turbinate. A draft 3 is from, from here to here, where you actually take the middle turbinate out. Uh, I'm sorry, draft 2B from here to here, where you could take the middle turbinate head out. And a draft 3 is when you actually connect from lamina to lamina. So all of you guys have learned that uh, already. Um, a quick example of a draft 2A, even though I don't consider that an, ex uh, uh, an extended surgery, um, so, so this patient here, if you see here, has this kind of disease. And the way we would do a draft 2A, which again, I would not consider an extended procedure is uh, the way we do it, you take, an, uh, take the unsinate process, um, take a curved microdebrider. You don't want a straight microdebrider doing this because you don't want to create any trauma over the lateral nasal wall. And then after you've done this, then you wanna go find for the frontal sinus recess for a bit. And we're gonna just keep moving this forward and then open the frontal sinus and then go all the way up to remove the partition. Those cases, you wanna make sure you preserve as much of the mucosa as you do it to so make sure you use um, really fine dissection technique. And at the end, you get this kind of opening um, in the frontal sinus, and this is the post-op. Well, and the drive to be, 
I would say this is the first extended surgeries that I would say I would consider extended. Um, I only usually used to save that for revision surgery in the front of sinus. I tend not to do a draft to be that much because currently I believe this is one of those surgeries that tend to have the most failure. If you're gonna open um, and do a draft to be, um, I think a draft to be a lot of time requires you to drill. And if you're gonna drill, you're gonna have a lot of periosteal reaction and that's gonna cause this to actually close up. So if I'm gonna do a draft to be now, I would change it into something different either doing a, a, a draft three, opening the whole thing, or doing what's called a sub to the lock rope or, um, or a mini lock rope to make sure that I connect it to the contralateral side. And I'll give you some examples of this, but this is the draft to be. I used to do that, uh, but I don't think that, uh, yes, it can work, but I do believe that this still has a lot of failure and there's better things you could do to actually get this not to close. The draft three, I think, is one of the best procedures you could do for the frontal sinus. If currently we have the visualization, we have the techniques, um, I would advise people that to go to the surgery, even in a lot of new cases, I would do this in order to get medications in there. So this is an example of a patient who I did a draft three in. Again, typical story that this patient um, had multiple surgeries, had multiple sinus, um, uh, frontal sinus surgeries as well. Um, patient had six previous surgeries and came back um, to, after that. And still you have all of this um, swelling. Um, and the frontal sinus is always the area that blocks first because medication cannot get into that. Um, I don't, why, uh, there's people who believe you should do, again, like a Harvey mentioned, you could do it in um, an outside in or inside out. To me, um, you take what the case gives you, okay? If it's easy to find the, the, one of the frontal sinus recesses, you find it and you go from there to the other side. If you cannot find the frontal sinus recess, then you do the outside in approach where you go straight in the midline, um, find the uh, first olfactory uh, fibers, and then go and cheer to it. But usually just do it as the case allows you to do it. Um, always try to find, um, I just try to find the, the, um, the osteum if you can, and if you can, then you go to the, to the um, um, outside in um, approach um, as described by uh, Dr., um, Dr. Harvey. So when you are doing a draft three, uh, one thing that I've seen a lot of people make a mistake at is this area here. Many people are concerned about getting a CSF leak and they don't drill that, that area here. And I used to do the same thing. Uh, people are scared of drilling on the posterior wall, rightfully so, but you should learn to do a lot of dissection in the lab, train your hands to be able to, con to control your hand. But if you leave this ledge here, this is gonna be a ledge that's gonna actually cause you to have one area where things are gonna just start forming into it and scarbing. And, and I've had failures typically is because of that. So in here, you continue that. And then again, after that, I'll say you have to go and drill all of these areas. And I tend to use the propellant implant in those cases, um, but in for many instances, people don't have propellant implants. Um, so um, I would keep those patients on steroid uh, afterward. And this is how this patient would look like two weeks afterward. Um, and this is about a month. You still see in here, uh, it's not completely healed yet, but you want that large cavity so that medications can get in here, topical steroid to prevent the recurrence. Um, so this is not a case that I've done for um, chronic rhinosinusitis, but this was a patient where the draft to be performed for a, um, an inverting papilloma. And again, this is one of the reasons why I do not like the draft to be because I feel as though the draft to be tends to, to, to close up um, more than others. So you do a superior septectomy here. Uh, you could preserve this mucosa if you want to put as a, as a graft uh, anterior to the, uh, right in the, uh, in the area of the beak. Um, 
or you could remove it. Um, I think now more and more I tend to preserve it and use it as a, as a free graph in the anterior peak. Um, as you're doing these surgeries, make sure you try to use multiple hands. Um, again, I think um, having a suction in there um, helps. And then use a micro -debuter. I use the drill and I use curved suctions. You see here, you're taking your time, drilling with a control fashion, and you wanna open all of this um, and a combination of micro degree C spine curette and the jewel is what I typically use to really to really open it. And, it. and as I mentioned before, you also have to make sure you drill the posterior part of the posterior um, aspect of the cuneiform there. Um, and then we move the, the papilloma. Um, in this specific instance, um, I use a curve um, suction and then use this device where you could sort of like shape it in fashion that you want here so that it could get into the front of sinus. So this is a nice little trick uh, because uh, if you don't actually change this, uh, the curvature in multiple places, you would not be able to get every aspect. Uh, also very important, if you're gonna use this to actually take away the mucosa in the front of sinus, or you're going to use it, uh, um, you should make sure that you do not keep it at a high intensity. I would not go above 15, colorizing into the front of sinus, specifically in the posterior wall, because this can transmit into the brain. So uh, you may consider doing this with a bipolar, but the bipolar would not, is not gonna give you the kind of configurations that you need to get into every single area of the front of sinus. So that's a way to really get in there with that curvature, but decrease the intensity of, of, your, of your instrument. Um, and you could, um, in this case, um, cauterize most of the uh, walls of the front of sinus um, safely. And as you could see in here, all of this portion here, you have to drill it to make sure you have a large anterior posterior uh, dimension. Again, that portion here, if you don't drill it, you're gonna have these ledges coming out and that's not going to, to be something that's gonna give you success. And those patients are likely are gonna have um, closure of that, uh, of that platelet cavity. Um, this is a case where we had to do a revision lath Um, So in some cases, it's actually important for those patients to come back. If they don't come back and you don't debride and clean their nose, this is what you're gonna have happening where those patients are going to have a recurrent disease in here where you have to go ahead and reopening them. And as you could see in here, the mistake was this portion here was left and uh, in the revision case, I made sure that all of this area was really, really removed um, because that ledge is what typically is going to give you um, the, 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 the area that's gonna cause the, the, the closure. So again, take all of that out and draw this area uh, uh, because uh, if you don't, um, at least in my, in my hand, that's what tend to give me to give me a, um, uh, a um, failure. What about a case like this in the frontal sinus? Well, for frontal sinus disease that are very lateral, uh, I did this cadaveric dissection that shows that you could do something called a hemilothrop. What the hemilothrop is, is you do a 2B in one side, but you go from the contralateral side and you can put instrument and visualization that gives you a better access. So this is the same endoscope going from ipsilateral and then going from the contralateral to, the, to, to this window. Um, this was later published as a case series um, that shows you you could actually go laterally over, over it. So this is an extended procedure that I would do for chronic sinus disease. Um, this is an example of such a case. If you look at this case, this patient has this thing here at previous surgery but uh, as you could tell, there was, um, there was this thing going all the way laterally. Um, so in this case, I needed uh, access. I tried to open that, that surgery, but I couldn't really get in there. Um, so I 
data 2b still couldn't get up there um, in the area that he needed, I needed to open. The area was really here. So in these cases, went in data superior septectomy and then came from the contralateral side. Now where I was able to drill and, and from the contralateral side, I had a better angle. So in this case, you do a 2B with a superior septectomy. It's like a hemilateral, and that gives you better lateral access to, uh, to, the, to the contralateral side. Uh, another case is when you have a case like this where you had trauma or you had, you had medial orbital decompression, and those patients don't want an external procedure. Um, so in this case, what you do is you do a 2B in the contralateral side, and you take the intersinus septum. This is what I term a mini lot rope, where again, uh, you can't go from the ipsilateral side here. Then you make this side join to the contralateral side. So you do 2B here, um, intersinus septum uh, and mini lot rope. And these patients, this is the cadaveric dissection. I also wrote a, a case series on those um, that shows um, how you can, uh, you can actually do this case. And here, you can go here, 2B, enter sinus septectomy, um, and then give you this picture and you make this drain in the contralateral side. Okay. Um, there's also something called a subtotal lot rope. Uh, in this case, if you have a case where you need to have access to the bilateral uh, posterior wall of the frontal sinus, uh, what you do is you do a 2B. In one side, in the ipsilateral side, you do an intersinus septectomy and a superior septectomy. That gives you access to both nasal cavities. You can actually see the whole posterior wall of the frontal sinus. And I use this for encephalocele uh, of the posterior wall of the frontal sinus. I use it for anterior skull base resection because I don't think in those cases you need to open the contralateral frontal sinus recess. Um, I'll show you a quick video of such a procedure. Um, actually, this is um, an example of a um, patient with a, uh, an estrogen neuroblastoma um, in here. I'm going to do an anterior skull base resection, but I started in the ipsilateral side, did a 2B, and then after the 2B, I connected to the contralateral side and then did the superior uh, septectomy here. And uh, in this specific case, you preserve the contralateral middle turbinate and the contralateral frontal sinus recess. And uh, what ends up happening in this case, even if after your surgery, the frontal sinus were to close up, because you preserve the middle turbinate and the frontal sinus output track in the contralateral side, and you remove the intersinus septum, any closure is going to drain into the untouched frontal sinus recess. Um, so that's what I call the subtotal lot work. Okay, and this is this case after radiation. You see this one looks fine. Um, we didn't touch the middle terminate and the contralateral side. You do have contractions happening in the subtotal lot rope, but even if the subtotal lot rope were to close completely, um, it would be it would be uh, adequate. So I have another video of a subtotal lot rope. Um, I'm not gonna go through it completely, just in the interest of time. This is for patients with uh, this large uh, mucosil here. Um, that ended up um, being a, um, a, a cholesterol granuloma. Um, um, if people want me to share that with them in the interest of time, I'm going to move forward. I'll share it with them later on. Um, you could use the subtotal lot rope also, um, like I said, for cases of a large CSF leak, like big pneumo, um, pneumocephalus like this, large defect, where you need to actually use both nostrils to get bimanual binational uh, access. Um, so in this case, I start here by doing a superior septectomy. You open um, this into a 2B. And um, you preserve the contralateral recess. I'm going to keep moving forward here. And that shows you the whole posterior wall of the frontal sinus. Um, and again, because we have the superior septectomy, you can use instrument in both nostrils. Uh, it's a little bit easier for you. You have somebody else hold the scope for you uh, and then use both hands to go ahead and, uh, and close that, that defect. Um, again, this is not a talk about um, um, scorbis defect repair. 
But um, I just wanted to point out that these techniques that you do for extended um, pontus sinus surgeries can be used uh, in scorby surgeries uh, as well. And then the last uh, one is something like this where a patient has this kind of uh, um, mucosal in the pontus sinus where you could just do a little lynch incision. But if those patients do not want the lynch incision, what you could do is uh, you just go straight in the midline. Um, um, I'm sorry, let's, you, instead of doing a tree fine, um, you could go straight in the midline um, just uh, as you are going to do a, um, an, uh, an uh, outside um, in approach, uh, but uh, you don't include the pontosinus recesses. Because in this specific case, what you need to understand is once you remove this partition, um, the content of this mucosal is going to turn to the, to the contralateral side and this patient should be fine. And this is inside the operating room when we remove this here. I'll show you a quick video of that um, case. So you go ahead, you do a straight superior septectomy. Uh, you, you see the middle turbinate are gonna be posterior to you here. You open right in the midline here, just like, like I said, you do an outside in. And then you want to keep drilling until you see the partition. There's usually a lot of blood in here. This is the partition. Then you take a point of sinus curate, go in there, and just take that partition out. Um, and once you take the partition, you're going to drain that, that uh, mucosal or mucopyosal. And then um, afterwards, you want to continue to drill and open this partition because that becomes the new opening of that contralateral point of sinus. So most likely the opening that you've created here is gonna close up, but it doesn't matter if that inferior um, access closes up because the partition has allowed you to connect the two pontus sinuses and any content is gonna drain into contralateral side. And it doesn't matter, you could decide to put a stent in there, you could decide to put a, a propeller implant. In my experience, either one of those um, tend to have significant contraction if it doesn't completely contract. So to recapitulate, in terms of pontus sinus, you don't, the way I classify it for extended surgery is just a draft one, which is what I call an Eloy one. A draft two A is between the lamina propitia and the middle uh, and the middle turbinate. Again, think about the borders; anything inside goes away. A draft uh, two B um, is uh, between the lamina propitia and the um, the septum. And then the draft three, uh, which I kept as the same name um, for us uh, um, to, to keep it simple, is between the two lamina propitious. So all of those have been described in the literature. What hasn't been described is this process where you do a 2B in one side, and then you go and add a superior septectomy so that you could get more lateral. Uh, and I call that a 2C. Um, the, Cases where you cannot go into its lateral because either uh, there was an orbital decompression or there has been too much bone in this area that you don't want to have to deal with. You do a 2B here and then enter sinus septectomy with a lot of things to do into the contralateral side. And then the subtotal lathrop, which I call an Eloy 2E, is when instead of doing a full lathrop in those cases, you preserve one of those and your advantage is you do have bimanual, binational access, but by preserving this, if this area were to close, you do have this here, uh, which you didn't touch where this thing would drain. And then the central lateral is uh, going straight in the midline, take a partition out, and you don't touch any of the frontal sinus recess. There's a high incidence of this closing up where you make the approach. However, because none of the um, recesses were touched, and you've combined all of the cavities in the frontal sinus, things would actually drain uh, appropriately in one of those. Um, so this is the new classification. This graphing is one of the papers that I'm gonna show later um, with those four new modifications that you could use in select um, cases. Um, all of those classifications are described in this clinic uh, um, that I edited with uh, Michael Setson. There's also a clinic chapter that talk about extended endoscopic and open sinus surgery that has a, uh, uh, most of those things that I've described today. 
Um, what I, uh, in terms of ex external approach for the pontus sinus, I tend sometimes to combine a little uh, tripine incision with endoscopic approach. Um, the lynch incision on um, external pontoidectomy, you could use as well. I tend not to do that, uh, but in some cases of osteomas that goes in both places, you could add that uh, to an endoscopic approach. And of course, the osteoplastic flap. Um, you can still use, there's still a, a place for it, but we use it less and less in our practice as we're actually developing more and more endoscopic techniques to reach most areas. Um, I'd like to point your attention to this. Uh, this is a chapter that I would just specifically on as you're doing more extended cases that shows you how to prevent yourself from getting in trouble. How do you prevent yourself from having complications? Um, I think this is a work that I'm very proud of, so I would advise people to take that. Uh, Dr. Cassiano's uh, um, um, textbook, which I co-authored with him, has a lot of this anatomy. Um, a lot of the diagram was just pure cadaveric dissection that we actually had an artist um, to take uh, um, artistic description of them uh, with key landmarks. I also now started to open my fellowship, um, which I kept mostly to US grads. Um, but uh, as of this year, I'm opening it to international fellows as well. So anyone who wants to come for an international fellowship, please, uh, please let me know. Um, and I also, over the last three years, I've been having one week to three months um, um, observership for people who would like to come see what we do. Um, you're welcome um, to, to join us. And uh, that's all I have. I'll take any questions uh, that you guys may have at this point. Thank you so much, Anderson, for the presentation. And uh, for, for those who don't know, before um, starting the presentation, John asked me, can we, can we you know, advertise my, my fellowship program and observation program? And I said, yes, it's of course is one of the best place to advertise those things because our, our aim is to provide education. So I think anything regarding education should be published from us and it's completely in the, in the same field that we want to read. So uh, in order to proceed, before going a steps ahead, um, I would like to uh, stress one thing. Um, tomorrow, uh, I'm sorry, tonight, for those who don't know, let me let me just share this one. Uh, since uh, uh, my association and the European Rhinologic Society has started to share and uh, participate each other and, and we are collaborating. I would like to stress a lot tonight. It's going to be uh, um, at 7 p.m. UK time, which means 8 p.m. Rome time. We will have uh, an ERS webinar series. It's a panel tonight. Uh, Professor Claire Hopkins, uh, I'm just learning uh, my master, we're going to talk about different aspects during this COVID-19 pandemic. So if anyone would like to join that, it's free few places available the password is here all the information will be available on our um on our facebook channel by the way so uh, let's get back to the questions uh, so let's start with this uh the first question is uh, coming from germany are you using copulation how did you turn up the tip of the instrument for cauterize the mucosa uh yes it's actually not copulation it's just a um a suction bogey just a regular suction bovi. Um, you could use an, an eight or, or a 10 um, French diameter. And it's just, you just take a mosquito and then you just, um, a mosquito clamp and you just turn it um, how you want. So it's just a malleable suction bovi that we use in ENT all the time. Great. Now the question from South Africa, are you removing the posterior portion of the inferior turbinate to access the middle meatus? No, no, I, I, I don't do that. Actually, uh, in my training, Dr. Uh, Cassiano, that was the first move that he would do. Uh, he, uh, he always removed the anterior portion of the middle turbinate. Even when I do a lot rope, now I try to protect um, the middle turbinate. The reason is in, in, the, in the Northeast, it's really dry. And uh, I feel as though uh, when you remove that, the patients, uh, it's, it's not the best option for the patients. They have crossing. So I preserve that uh, the middle terminate as much as I as I can. Great. 
from the Netherlands, are you using medial maxillectomy in cases of philipoid poison rhinus sinusitis? Yes. Um, yes. Uh, if a patient has had multiple, multiple surgeries and they keep failing, my next one is going to be to do a, an MI procedure. But if they fail the MI procedure, then I would go with a medial maxillectomy. And if they do fail a normal medial maxillectomy where I preserve the mucosa, I would go back and I would remove all the mucosa. But after I remove the mucosa, I would take the suction bovi, curve it, and then I would actually remove the mucosa and cauterize the wall. And by doing this, what happens is you, again, this is a, the, the further step, you, it causes contraction of the, uh, of the maxillary sinus. It's almost like you obliterate it and there's gonna be new bone formation um, and, and those patients tend to do well. But I'll say this is the, the, the most extreme cases uh, so it's stepwise, um, you do the, again, you do the um, EMA, EMA doesn't work, medial maxillectomy, preserve the mucosa, that doesn't work, then remove the mucosa. And if I'm going to remove the mucosa, I cauterize it to auto obliterate the, uh, the sinus. Great. Another question from Thailand. Uh, what is the meaning of nasalization? Yes. So this is just the term meaning that you remove all the mucosa. That's all it is. So um, again, you could do a total hemorrhoidectomy by preserving the mucosa, which is what we usually do in the overwhelming majority of cases. But in those cases of condemned mucosa, uh, where they've had like six, seven surgeries, typically before when I was in fellowship, we would just remove the mucosa. This is nasalization. This is not a new concept. Jankowski has been doing it. I don't to worry about it. Uh, but then we came to an era where people stopped doing it because we try to preserve every little bit of mucosa. So it's sort of like a seesaw where we have to kind of find a balance. I do believe in some cases, just like uh, 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 Klaus uh, mentioned from Ghent, um, you, you should remove it, you know? So that, that's what nasalization is. You remove the mucosa of the, of the, of the area. Another question, this is from UK. Superior suprabullar cell is the first phobia. Superior suprabullar cell is the first phobia. Yeah, that's the one that's actually next against the fovea hemorrhoidalis. And if you look at it, uh, the portosinus, um, not the, the anterior ethmoid, is usually right in the posterior wall of that, not in, in the anterior. And a lot of um, uh, in a lot of description out there, they place the anterior eight mode right in the front of these cells, right at the posterior aspect of the frontal sinus recess. But that's a mistake. The, 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 the anterior eight mode is a little bit more posterior, uh, right in the posterior wall of that of that cell. Great. Well, last two questions. The first one, Canada. Do, do, do the patient with steroid implant need nasal douches anyway? And if yes, nebulization or high flow irrigation? I, I irrigate all of those patients. Uh, even with nasalization. And, and in fact, I do believe in patients with nasalization, you need to irrigate them even more because those patients have more coarsening afterward, right? Um, because it's more dry. So you have to make sure you irrigate those patients. So let's get back in here to the application. Now the time for those questions. So the first one is any change of in technique in this COVID era? Well, uh, we, we, we are not uh, replying to those questions because it's not the, the, um, the topic of, uh, of Professor Eli, but you will have those answered tonight at the ERS meeting. Uh, the other question from Anno is, do you have a template of, of Celestic that you use in your draft three and draft two C to the EF? Is it, is it talking, um, I didn't um, have a question. Yeah, I think that he, uh, Reno uh, requested, do you have a template of Celastic that you used in your draft two, three, and draft two C? Yes, so I actually don't like using Celastic uh, uh, amplets and I don't have a template. Um, to tell you the truth, um, the Celastic split, if you're gonna use it, I think you should cut it yourself and then frame it because every patient is different. So I don't have a template that I use. Um, that's one thing. The second thing is, my feeling is, I'll say I may put a Celastic plate uh, implant in about maybe less one to two percent of my cases. And those are the most challenging cases. Mm -hmm. So 
uh, if you see the scholastic thing, it's usually in cases that you feel as though, oh my God, this is gonna close. So it's almost like a Hail Mary that you're actually, <laughs> you're actually doing with, uh, with the scholastic split. Um, and um, a lot of those cases, what end up happening after you remove the scholastic after six weeks to three months, you start seeing a lot of con uh, um, um, uh, concentric um, uh, scarring. And you keep praying that it doesn't completely um, close. But uh, uh, yeah, that's one of the reasons why uh, I, don't, I don't like it. Um, yeah, again, it's more of a last resort kind of thing. Great. So just to, to end the topic, thank you so much. We are a little bit out of time. For other questions, I think that Professor Eloy is available anytime you want. You can reach to him. Just send him an email. And if you're interested for a fellowship, please, please, please just uh, uh, confirm and uh, get more information from him. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Eloy, for being with us today. So once again, tonight, 8 p.m., Rome Zone Time, 7 p.m., UK, ERS webinar series. Uh, then don't forget to connect for the other two of our beautiful presentation, which is going to be on Wednesday. The first one is how companies can remain competitive in the new world. I would suggest for anyone to, to stay in this and get connected in this because uh, this is something that is not... Um, this is not regarding medicine. This is something that is uh, for companies. Uh, and due to the fact that uh, medicine and, and also hospital are in, in that field, we should be competitive. And we, I think that everyone should be up to date with this. And the other appointment at 5 p.m., that, that was at 3 p.m. and 5 p.m., it's uh, my partner, Ani Joshri, who's talking about deviating knows the functional aspect of it. Other, um, other meetings are available, and you will see all the schedule on our Facebook pages. Thank you, Professor Light, for being with us, and it was a really great pleasure for having you. Thank you for having me, Priya. And, and I hope really to, to see you back soon or, or meet you personally as soon as possible. Thank you once again, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you.